Well, one thing since lockdown began that has really surprised me is the level of compliance. Yes, of course, there are some people out protesting, some people who treated the rules with utter contempt from the very beginning, but actually a lot of us have been complying with the rules. And still, there seem to be quite a few people out there very, very frightened of this virus. I've been wondering why. Well, somebody that's been working hard on this is Laura Dodsworth, and she's written a book called A State of Fear. And this book is a bestseller. It's done phenomenally well. And Laura joins me now on Talking Pints. Cheers and welcome to GP News. Yes, thank you. I'll toast you with my goldfish bowl of wine. Mm. <laughs> Laura, I have to tell you that until this book came out and people started to talk about it or rave about it or um, be appalled by it, um, because it has provoked a lot of opinions... You know, I didn't really know who you were. So tell us first, who is Laura Dodsworth before this incarnation as a bestseller? Well, I'll forgive you for not having heard of me. It's no, I first, haven't. I'm uh, being honest. No, it's fine. It's my first uh, political polemical book. I, right. I didn't know I had one in me, but this is mm. what lockdown and a barrage of behavioural science and fear messaging has done to me. Um, so I'm a writer and a photographer and a couple of films under my belt too. And I'm probably better known for my other books, which are about the body, which in a similar way to A State of Fear explore issues of taboos and what makes us who we are. But they're more about the politics of power, shame, sexuality and gender. And this is about the politics of fear. So behavioural psychology, this is in the number 10 uh, Downing Street bunker. The, I mean, they were worried, weren't they? They were worried at the beginning of this. Here was a, a virus we knew very little about. Mm. We didn't know how to treat it. We were seeing some pretty shocking scenes from Milan and northern Italy, and the decision was taken to lock down until perhaps we could find some way of dealing with it. And I, I kind of get that. I understand why they did it. Yeah. They, they were very, very scared. And as I say, those, those, those scenes from Milan were quite shocking, I think. You know, people lying in hospital corridors and, 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 and the system unable to cope. So that's why they had to try and find a way of making people comply. Mm. And is that where the fear messaging began? Uh, that's where it begins. Now, you talk about the fear, basically, that our rulers felt. And I, I mm. have never been surprised mm. that they've used fear to encourage compliance when they themselves felt fear. And in an epidemic, fear, fear is completely natural. The problem with fear is when it's deliberately amplified or when it's not calibrated to the scale of the threat. Now, you say that there were scary images from, from Milan, of mm. course, from, from Wuhan. And China had modelled lockdown. Um, the first time the world's ever done a lockdown is China, because my book isn't about lockdown, so I don't want to get too caught up in it. But it's impossible to talk about the behavioural science approach to make people comply with lockdown without talking about it. And it's important to understood that lockdown was never on any pandemic plans before. And an epidemic and a coronavirus epidemic were very high up on the national risk register and there was never a plan to lock down. As Neil Ferguson said in a quite extraordinary interview with The Times, they thought, we couldn't do that, could we? And then we thought, yes, we well, can, because well. they did it in Italy. So we import this totalitarian, brand new tool and political leaders thought, how will we get people to comply? The reason we know we th they thought like this is because of the minutes of a spy B meeting. That's the scientific pandemic influenza group on behaviour. The question is, how do we make people follow the lockdown rules? There are various answers. There's a suite of options. And one is to raise people's sense of personal threat because people understood that they weren't at risk in their demographic and they wanted everybody to feel at risk to comply with the rules. And they succeeded with this, did they? They did succeed with it. I mean, we know in May, for instance, that three quarters of people were too scared to go to hospital in case they caught COVID. So, um, I mean, one of the tenets of my book is that fear creates collateral damage. It creates harms in itself. Mm. And we can see now the knock-on effects in waiting lists, in um, late treatment for oncology and heart disease, that people being scared to go to hospital because the, th the threat and the fear well, being amplified yeah. causes collateral damage. But equally, the hospitals weren't fully operational for other procedures and we're 5.3 mm. million operations behind. We have, you know, waiting... I mean, I, I completely understand what you're saying, that it may well be that longer term uh, there is more death uh, through a lack of diagnosis or missed operations than there will ever be 
with COVID-19 written on the death certificate. I do understand that fully. Mm. But how specifically did they scare people? What did they do? What, what, and you're right, people were scared because I've been astonished by some of the opinion polls through all of this. Yeah. You, know, you know, showing wh whatever the government did, however authoritarian it may have looked to you, when they polled people, mm. it did seem that quite consistent majorities thought the government was right to take this action. Mm. What, what techniques specifically did they use mm. to put fear into people's minds? Yeah, approval ratings for the government have never been higher as they were on the 23rd of March when we, when we went into a lockdown. And uh, uh, unbelievable. Yeah, well, it's actually not because um, fear inducements are quite well understood and people do turn to authoritarian government during epidemics and specifically when there's a crisis and when they're frightened. This isn't, this isn't unheard of. Um, yes, yeah, so, so, ti so time of war... You, you, you want to believe in the government and support the government, yeah. and similarly with, with sort of time of plague or yeah. the modern in equivalent. Interestingly, approval ratings and Boris Johnson's po popularity are plummeting now. I think people probably want to get back to normal. But you can see that people were still very frightened in the lead up to the 19th of July, the supposed Freedom Day, mm. on the day that vaccine man uh, passports were announced. You know, uh, yeah, freedom. So-called Freedom Day. <laughs> um, but the, the anxiety was really palpable among commentators and, you know, there were polls about it and in the media. Mm. So the tools they used, um, the most egregious behavioural science tools are these fear and shaming and norming. So you can see that in, in a variety of tactics. There's lots of advertising. We've spent um, a fortune on, oh, on advertising. Newspaper ads, radio ads, tele yeah, yeah, I mean, everywhere. Yeah. yeah, television, everything. And some of those ads were designed to put the, you know, put the, scare the living daylights out mm. of you. And, you know, you could argue that that's, that's right and good because we're in an epidemic. But what they did was democratise the risk. They... Um, conveyed the idea that everybody was equally at risk, which wasn't true. There's um, a huge difference in your risk, whether you're young or old. It's a very age-stratified can you, disease. Can you look into his eyes or whatever it was well, they that's, used? Yeah, that's one of, him, one of them. Um, look him in the eyes and tell him you never bend yeah, the rules. Yeah. So an ad like that is designed to frighten you. It's very close up, very grainy, mm -hmm. kind of horror film-esque. I'm easily frightened. Other people might not think it's like a horror film. <laughs> well, it looks like the British um, public were. Yeah, but it, what it also does is encourage a bit of finger pointing. You know, if COVID's spreading, it's because you've broken the rules. Mm. And what that does is deflect as well away from politicians and policies and institutions. Mm. And at the time that that would have been conceived and executed, we know Matt Hancock was having an affair. He wasn't too scared himself. Um, <laughs> oh, so, <laughs> oh. <laughs> just had to drop that That's one That's quite in. political. But yeah. yeah. Um, well, also the use of... Um, Stats, so cherry picking the worst figures, floating the big numbers up to the top. There's been a lot of modelling. There's been a lot of modelling in this yeah, pandemic I mean, and presentation of worst case scenarios. And, and Neil Ferguson has a bit of a track record in modelling and, and perhaps over exaggerating. I, th I think we go right back, don't we, to sort of CJD 20 years ago and, and, and predictions of what that might lead to, which mercifully it didn't. But why have the British public been so compliant? Is, is, is that just in our nature? Are we, are we a very law-abiding country? I don't know. I'd be interested in more cross-cultural anthropological studies on that. I honestly can't speak authoritatively on it. But I would say that I think in our country we had a very organised behavioural science approach. So one... Act, and generally the reaction to the book's been tremendous. But one accusation that was levelled at me was that it's a conspiracy theory that the government leveraged fear. This is a little naive. Whatever you think of the politicians, our behavioural science team are very well established. We have behavioural scientists in every government department, mm -hmm. in all the agencies that work for the government. There's the behavioural insights team. And then we have a, um, a team of advisors, uh, social scientists and psychologists on Spy B. We actually export behavioural science all around the world. We're very good at it. So I suspect if we were very compliant, it's because we had maybe the most barrage of, of fear-mongering in the world. We were one of the most frightened countries in the mm. world. But they were doing it to protect us. You can argue there's a net benefit. You can. And I think that's a debate that should be had. I mean, if you read the book, my colours are nailed quite firmly to the mast. I think the use of fear is at best morally dubious. Mm -hmm. If psychologists wanted to make you frightened in a lab... 
you would have to sign a consent form. I mean, actually, it'd be really hard to get the ethics approval for it, but you'd have to consent. <laughs> and they would not let you leave the lab until you were in at least as good a state as you arrived. You know, you'd be watching a rom-com and having a slice of chocolate cake before you leave the lab. Mm. There's no rom-com or chocolate cake for us right now, is there? It's one variant after another. Even in the last week, there was a headline that um, new potential new COVID variant means that one in three Brits might de- die from the latest modelling. Well, another alternative... Mm is that the latest variant might be like the common cold, which is in the whole paper, but it's the scary headline. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, which, I, I understand which that. sticks so, and makes the news. So, Laura, given the passion you feel about this, have you been part of the anti lockdown protests? I have not been part of them, no. but I've covered three for the media. Right. Um, which I think is very important. I th- there's been, um, I mean, there have been very big protests on what I perceived when I have been at But the led by people like Piers Corbyn. I think some have been... They're not particularly credible people. Do you know what I think? Well, far from it, actually. I don't think they're very led. I think it's a coalition of lots of grassroots people. I saw a massive variety of placards, lots of different Mm. types of people. Mm. They're in some kind of, like, fringe, hippie, crusty people. Yeah, the anti-vaxxers you'd expect, but also families, elderly people, all different... And have you had the vaccine? Um, I have a different... I have a medical situation. I'm quite surprised you've asked me because here we... Well, I, this is a weird situation where we're asked to discuss a very private... Well, you haven't got to answer it, but, I, but I'm interested. I'm interested in that. I have um, a medical contraindication for the vaccine, but I have had a variety of vaccines. Okay. But this one causes problems with allergies, which makes it difficult okay. for some people. Um, the question of the vaccine passport is something that's easier for me to discuss. Um, at the moment, the government's using the vaccine passport, it seems, as a tool to encourage uptake. Oh, yeah, they're the bullying vaccine. the young and you can't go to nightclubs and all the rest of it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, we've heard politicians being quite open about that now, but also one of the, one of the godfathers of Nudge, um, Richard Thaler, was talking about this. Um, he and Cass Sunstein wrote, wrote the book on Nudge, it's called Nudge, and Cass Sunstein heads up the World Health Organization's Pavel Insights team, and he was saying that, you know, this is good, vaccine Vaccine passports and workplace restrictions mm, will make people it. have the vaccine. Uh, so the vaccine yeah. passport is another yeah. behavioural science tool yeah. to encourage people yeah. to have the vaccine. Yeah, no, no I'm, I'm completely against vaccine passports, I can promise you. And this is your first foray into this sort of public space. What next? Um, well, I was actually starting to write a different book last year when lockdown put the... Um, kind of wiped that off the table Mm -hmm. and when I was talking to my publisher about that book I discussed an idea for an article I had about the weaponization of fear and they diverted me into this so I think I'm going to go back to my my (laughs) idea that I had on the table last year now we're back out in the real world again well whether people agree with you or disagree with you with this book you've certainly made a mark and Laura Dodsworth I think is a name we may well be hearing again thank you Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.